This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to take a moment to welcome members of our armed forces who are joining us over the Internet, especially those of you who are serving abroad. Thank you for being with us again. In just a moment, one of our country's foremost historical writers, Mr. John F. Ross, will be with us to tell the story of World War I ace Eddie Rickenbacker, a story masterfully chronicled in Ross's latest book, Enduring Courage. Rickenbacker was not only responsible for pushing automobile racing to its limits, but aircraft speed and agility to their limits as well. But before Ross joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. For starters, Ross's life reads like an adventure novel. He has chased scorpions in Baja, dived 3,000 feet underwater in the Galapagos, dog sledded in Greenland, lived with the Conti reindeer herders in Siberia, launched the most northern canoe trip in the Canadian Arctic, and explored old castles in Europe for the Discovery Channel. Like a modern-day Hemingway, Ross has used all of this experience to breathe life into his writing. In addition to being the chief editor for American Heritage and Invention and Technology magazines, he's also the recipient of the Fort... Ticonderoga Award for Contributions to American History. Ross served on the board of directors of the Smithsonian Magazine and has been a compelling guest on television and radio owing to his experience as a producer for CBS's Face the Nation. Ross is also the recipient of the National Cable Ace Award for his documentary work. But more than all of the awards and accolades, Ross would be the first to admit becoming a member of the Explorers Club of New York was one of the high points of a life richly lived. In addition to his newest book on Rickenbacker, Ross is also the author of War on the Run, a definitive biography of Robert Rogers, and The Polar Bear Strategy, Reflections on Risk in Modern Life. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report, adventurist and best-selling author, Mr. John F. Ross. Thank you for being with us today, Mr. Ross. Rebecca, thanks for having me on. Uh, so when most people think of Eddie Rickenbacker, they think of a flying ace, but something must have happened to cause you to think that there was a lot more to his story. So what first triggered your interest in this thrill seeker? Well, you know, Rebecca, when I was a kid, and that's often where some of the best ideas come, I read a book um, of his experiences in World War I flying over northeastern France against the likes of the Red Baron, and it was just so exciting to me. I remember just staying up all night with my flashlight, you know, reading about his adventures. And, you know, something stuck with me for years and years and years until finally, um, you know, being an author, I got a chance to really look into it. And you know, he just kept surprising me in the process of writing the book. He was uh, a race car driver of some renown. I had no idea until I got really deeply into it um, in the first Indianapolis 500s. I knew, of course, that he went on after the World War I to found Eastern Airlines. Uh, but no, you know, he just kept surprising me um, and continues to surprise me to this day. So let's start with uh, Rickenbacker's childhood. Like uh, many heroes, his early life was marked by tragedy. In 1904, he lost his father, uh, who I understand was put in a coma in an altercation with another man. And, and the young Rickenbacker was forced to quit school to support his family. Is that right? Yeah, you know, um, the uh, he was born to Swiss-German immigrants. Um, and in Columbus, Ohio, on the wrong side of the tracks, and they were so poor that he uh, sometimes didn't go to school because they didn't have enough winter coats to go around. He uh, recalls going to school with one black shoe and one brown shoe and getting the tar beaten out of him for that. Uh, the, the American dream around uh, uh, in the late 20, uh, 19th century for um, – some immigrants was just it was not all rose colored um and it wasn't for for Eddie's dad who just kind of just didn't really fit and didn't really he worked in a number of breweries and he had kind of odd jobs culminating in this tragic uh incident which you mentioned where in which 
um, an African American um, uh, late day laborer came over to talk to uh, Eddie's father and a bunch of uh, guys who were taking a lunch break. Um, they it was in the July and they were laying sidewalk, and uh, the man asked them if they had any extra lunch around, just food. And uh, Eddie's father just took great offense at this. Um, you know, if I had food, he said, you know, I'd give it to my family. And he just something boiled over, something snapped, and he went after this guy, and they got into a. Uh, a tussle, and um, he was knocked uh, into a coma um, by this fellow defending himself. And there was a big trial. It was a terrible embarrassment to the family that his father died um, after a few weeks in the hospital. And uh, and he had an older brother, but um, who kept in school. But the the, the day after the funeral. Um, he uh, pretended he was going to school, and he uh, split off from the rest of the kids in his family uh, and uh, went to work in a factory. And uh, that was the beginning of um, his real adventure in life. It, it was a great tragedy that someone would be asking for food or leftovers, and uh, it would lead to the death of Rickenbacker's father. Um, but within two years after his father passing away, um, he begins to discover racing automobiles. I, I think that's right. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it's such an interesting time. Right then, he was born in 1890, and in 1895, you have the really first workable uh, gasoline car. Now, they weren't very good yet. They had a race, and I think that they, you know, averaged seven miles an hour. Mm-hmm. But this was an incredible, it's almost, Rebecca, like a Wild West time, because people were realizing what the possibility of the motor car was going to be all about. So you have, um, uh, you know, David Buick, um, who, who had started out manufacturing plumbing fixtures. Well, he decides to, you know, turn his attentions to building cars. Walter Chrysler, you know, he was a, he was into locomotives, but he turned his attentions to that. Henry Leland, he was he was Cadillac. He had he had, he had been making firearms. George Pierce, uh, the Pierce Arrow, he made bird cages. So all of these people descended. And a lot focused around the Midwest to figure out what was going on. And there were incredible opportunities. And for a boy who came from nowhere, was anonymous, and had really no chance to really do much, um, this early world of car racing, and car racing because it was so extremely dangerous, was something that a young man who didn't want the anonymous job, I mean, he saw um, his you know, what happened to his father, but the, all of the people going to the factories, you know, for these long 15 hour stretches and coming back beaten and their bodies torn up, um, here in car racing, he could do something. He could establish himself, put together things that nobody could ever take away from him, you know, speed records and he could win races and he could make money and be, he could become a star. And, uh, that's what happened. But the trade-off was he entered a world of extreme risk. And, uh, those are some of the crazy stories that I write about. Well, the fact is, uh, if he hadn't entered a world with extreme risk, there would, was very limited opportunity for employment at that time. I mean, employment for someone with his skills and background really did mean a life in a factory uh, and, a, and a short lifespan as well. Um, and not a very happy one or productive one. Um, so, you know, it, to a certain extent, he looked at the risk and said, I don't see the risk uh, so much as I see the opportunity. Absolutely. And it's so interesting, Rebecca, at this point, you know, when you get new technology bursting on the scene. So, of course, as mentioned, the new, the first kind of car comes on scene and he's five years old. And then Kitty Hawk, uh, the first plane, heavier than air uh, powered plane is, is 1903. And he's, uh, he's 13. So he's on the cusp of these incredible things happening. And what usually happens in technology like this? Well, the first people who adopt the technology are amateurs, you know, the rich boys. That's right. And, That's uh, right. Now, unfortunately, John, we've got to take a commercial break, but let's pick that story up on the other side of the break because uh, it's important to know how it moved from the wealthy kids down to the kids that were really looking for opportunity like Rick and Bucker. So we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Costa Report.
Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile, and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM big data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. Every day our world gets more complicated. Not only is new information coming at us faster than we can manage, new regulations, technology, and the effects of globalization have made it much more difficult to succeed. That's why I wrote The Watchman's Rattle, a book that, for the first time, explains how complexity makes it hard to separate facts from fiction and eventually causes us to make important decisions based on unproven beliefs. And not just us, our leaders also fall prey to this phenomena. But here's the good news. Once you know the symptoms to watch for, you can safeguard against them. So please, go to RebeccaCosta.com. That's RebeccaCosta.com and order your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. It only takes a few minutes and the shipping is free. That's RebeccaCosta.com. Do it now. You'll be glad you did. Who might you save? Your mother, your father, your husband, uncle, and son. Learn fast. F-A-S-T. The sudden signs of a stroke and you could save. Your friend, your best friend, teacher, boss, coach. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. F-A-S-T. Face, arm, speech, time. That's F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. The sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in the recovery of... Your neighbor, the waiter, a fellow shopper, a total stranger, grandmother, grandfather. So learn FAST, the sudden signs of a stroke, then pass it on, because you never know who might save you. Your wife, your colleague, teammate, mother. Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. As I went through school, one giant question loomed over me. What did I want to be? But in order to know what I wanted to be, I had to first decide what I wanted to make. I wanted to make more. So I became a teacher. Now I make learning a privilege, not a chore. And frustration a tool, not an obstacle. I make working hard seem easy and giving up impossible. I make an old subject feel like a fresh thought and unconventional methods common. I make material things less important and little things like patience and kindness count. I make weekdays more exciting than weekends and classrooms feel like anything but. I make things different, which is all I ever hoped for. I'm a teacher. I make more. Find out how you can make more at teach.org. Make more. Teach. Brought to you by Teach and the Ad Council. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is author and historian John Ross. And before the break, we were talking about the fact that the initial opportunities in the automobile industry were available to uh, the wealthy uh, who could afford automobiles. But uh, quickly, opportunities began opening up all over the place. Uh, Now, we had to go to a break, John, but I wanted to give you a chance to finish that thought. Absolutely. And uh, you put put your 
thumb right on it. What we begin to see is, uh, you know, the millionaire's sons who could afford to have a couple cars or an airplane. And there was a, starting to be a transition to pros and, and to people who were dedicated to um, the racing, the flying in a very different, more business-like manner. And this is what Eddie represented, um, uh, certainly not coming from any sort of affluence like that. He had a very different relationship toward risk, and he wasn't looking out for glory and, and kind of some of the other things that some of the early amateurs were. And so it really we begin right at the beginning of the modern era is have this moment when um, this new technology is being mastered and introduced to the American public by this new breed of, of uh, people. Some people call them daredevils. Some people call them, you know, other things. But what they really were doing uh, in a professional way was showing America the way forward. Uh, through uh, in speed this extraordinary new new um, concept and feeling that was uh, just being delivered in cars and in airplanes in new ways that nobody had really figured out or felt before. So, what were some of the important contributions Rickenbacker made to automobile racing, for example? Well, he introduced the first hard helmet uh, at uh, an Indianapolis 500. Um, you've got to remember, too, Rebecca, when a new technology comes on board, often when we look back in the early days, very, very simple things, things that we take for granted that would be in place were not. For instance, they, did, they didn't wear seat belts. They had no windshields. The early car racers, they, they hadn't figured out uh, rearview mirrors. So what actually happened was a guy called a mechanician would sit right next to the pilot, to the driver. And so you'd actually, in each car racing in the early Indianapolis 500s, for instance, would be two guys. And the job of the mechanician would be to look behind and to tap the guy, his, the driver, on the, on the knee if people were coming up from behind. Um, I mean, it's <laughs> This was like normal. having an automobile wingman. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, so, so what Eddie helped develop a long way to your answer here, but what he helped develop was a real whole risk scenario. So, what was happening then, and Eddie really helped move this along, was a an understanding that you know the systematic risk management of kind of looking at those things and saying, yeah. Uh, you know, before when it was new, the, the, everybody said, well, the drivers know it's risky. You know, nobody wanted people to die, but they said, well, it's risky. And the drivers who are, are racing, they assume the risk. Um, and he started moving everybody towards a new place where the systematic use of safety features like seat belts and um, windshields and things like that, hard helmets, would be something that um, everybody, you know, the, the, the proprietors of the uh, racetracks and everybody would be expected to kind of help, you know, make it safer. And uh, so there's a whole transition. So those were the kinds of things that Eddie really was working on. Well, it is hard for us to imagine that something like a windshield had to actually be invented. <laughs> you know, we And you're right, we do take that for granted. Now, how does uh, Eddie take his love of speed to the air? Well, you know, the, um, <clears throat> so it was, it was pretty evident to anybody, and certainly somebody like Eddie, who became uh, by 1916 when World War I was going on, but we had not, we were America was certainly late into the war. We didn't get into the war until 1917, was that airplanes were really one of the new things. And he'd gotten a ride in a couple of them, and he was very intrigued with that whole idea. So what he did, and again, you got to remember, we're just, you know, just a decade, a little over a decade downwind from Kitty Hawk. So, so airplanes at this point were really, you know, not much more than mechanized, you know, uh, box kites with, with engines on them. <clears throat> They were very, very rudimentary. Yeah, still. you point out that the pilots suffered oxygen deprivation, nausea from the fumes, and periodic explosions were pretty common. Yeah, Rebecca, I mean, you think about it, right? So, again, like I was mentioning with the car, well, the things that they hadn't figured out with airplanes were were staggering as well. You know, so these poor guys, um, you know, today you can't go up above 10,000 feet because the Federal Aviation Admission uh, um, uh, FAA says that you, without supplemental oxygen, you have you to. Yeah, it's a requirement. 
Right, because you start uh, getting tunnel vision, your judgment starts getting skewered. Well, of course, these guys were bombing up to 15, 16, 17, 18,000, and at the end of the war towards, um, you know, 20, 21,000 feet, you know, and they were in open cockpits, so it was just freezing cold. Sometimes they'd have to peel their, you know, their fingers off their joysticks because they, they were just so cold. And um, the early motors, some of the engines w- were rotary and they were spitting off uh, castor oil by a gallon to two gallons an hour. And a lot of that, that was, you know, lubricating the engine, it was flying back into the face of the, um, of the pilot flying. But the big thing, the big thing, which is so crazy, was that um, though parachutes were invented, they were not issued to our pilots because the muckety-mucks back in Washington, D.C., who had no flying experience and they were making policy, decided that if they gave uh, pilots, these young guys who were in their 20, early 20s, if they gave them uh, parachutes, that they would be likely to jump out of planes at the first hint of trouble, and wouldn't that be a waste of good machinery? <laughs> uh, and, you know, this, boy, did this tick off. I mean, can, you can imagine that. Boy, did this Right. We, we don't want to give them an easy way out of a, cra- of yeah. a plane that's not working. No, so <laughs> the Germans adopted the, you know, you know, at the end of those last six weeks, but we never did until after the war. People woke up and said, "Well, oh my god, oh my god, we got to really be doing that." So, and you also have to remember too. So, I was talking about how rudimentary the planes were. Well, they were made out of wood, uh, you know, wooden frame ribs, kind of if you would canvas stretched over that and then doped over with a kind of a very highly flammable shellac. So this thing, these things could catch fire in a heartbeat and and burn up in two or three minutes. I never forget, I came across Quentin Roosevelt was Teddy Roosevelt's youngest son. And he went over in 21, 22, and he was a pilot for us in World War One. And I, I was reading um, his journals and he wrote a letter home and how he said he, he was taking off, right? This was just on the field. And he was taking off and... Uh, a, a rock uh, flipped up and broke his propeller, and a part of the propeller penetrated, punctured his gas tank. And in uh, 30 seconds, he was just getting off the ground. His entire uh, plane was on fire. And it, so he just getting off. It took him 30 seconds to bring it down. He jumped out, and his, his sheepskin boots and his pants were on fire already. Oh, this yeah. Was, oh, oh, yeah. And, and you know, another thing that we forget about is that there were no radios. I mean, there, there really was no safety equipment. Not, not only were there no parachutes, there were no radios. And the likelihood that the plane could catch fire was very high. And uh, it took no time at all for the plane to burn up. I mean, it was just a little tinderbox uh, with a human being uh, surrounding a human being. And made for a very difficult decision when they were three miles up and their plane caught fire. What would they you, do? You bet. So we, so we have that. to take another break, uh, but stay right where you are. We'll be right back with more from John Ross. You're listening to the Costa Report. The crisis in the Ukraine is the latest global conflict to pit the United States against Vladimir Putin's Russia. While the Cold War may have ended, U.S.-Russia diplomacy is here to stay. Understanding this volatile new era is not easy. For many years, experts have been trying to explain Russia's new leadership, but cracking the inner circle has remained elusive until now. The American Program Bureau represents some of the most knowledgeable and prominent Russian insiders who are available to speak to your organization. Experts such as Mikhail Gorbachev former leader of the Soviet Union and master architect of modern-day Russia, Vladimir Posner, the dean of Russian journalism, Andrei Kosarev, the first foreign minister under Boris Yeltsin, and Pavel Palashenko, chief advisor for 25 years to Gorbachev, are available to speak at your next event. No Speakers Bureau offers greater insights into how Russia impacts our economy, our world, and our lives. To schedule these esteemed leaders for your next event, contact the American Program Bureau at 800-225-4575 or apbspeakers.com. I go to school with your children. We say the Pledge of Allegiance together. I'm one out of every four children in America, and I'm struggling with hunger. I'm lucky to grow up where I could be whatever I want. I want to grow up and be someone who doesn't go to bed hungry. Please visit feedingamerica.org today and find your local food bank. Every dollar you donate helps provide seven meals for kids like me. Together, we're Feeding America. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. 
Today, my new dad threw a barbecue. I burnt everything. Ah! And then we played catch. I broke Mr. Lewis's window. And then, somehow, my hand. My hand! And then my dad even let me drive his car. The hospital's on the right! It was a rough day. It was a great day. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. For more information on how you can adopt, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A public service announcement from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. Hey, is that a faucet running? Nope. That's not a faucet. That's a river rushing through the forest. It is? Yeah. Forest rivers provide over 100 million people with clean water to drink. The water comes straight from the forest to us. In fact... What? I can't hear you because of the vacuum. That's not a vacuum. That's the trees in the forest cleaning up the air we breathe. How do trees clean the air? They soak up the dirty air on their leaves, branches, and trunks, which means clean air for us. Hmm. Cool. I didn't know that. Yep. But the forest does more than give us clean air and water. It gives us shade for hot days, birds to listen to, and trees to climb. Wow, that's awesome. I didn't know how cool the forest could be. Hey, let's go explore some more. Visit the forest today and enjoy all it does, just for you. To learn more about the forest and find one near you, go to discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Who might you save? Your mother, your father, your husband, uncle, aunt, son. Learn fast. F-A-S-T. The sudden signs of a stroke and you could save. Your friend, your best friend, teacher, boss, coach. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. F-A-S-T. Face, arm, speech, time. That's F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. The sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in the recovery of... Your neighbor, the waiter, a fellow shopper, a total stranger, grandmother, grandfather. So learn FAST, the sudden signs of a stroke, then pass it on, because you never know who might save you. Your wife, your colleague, teammate, mother... Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, our guest today is best-selling author Mr. John Ross, who has written an inspiring and thrilling new book titled Enduring Courage about flying ace Eddie Rickenbacker. Uh, Now, in the short course of his life, Rickenbacker went from automobile racer, flyer, and combat ace, and and then entrepreneur. In 1938, he bought Eastern Airlines. So, uh, how did that come about, John, and, and uh, how did he do as the owner of a commercial airline? Well, it's an interesting story because uh, uh, quite unusual for kind of an ace of aces, a war hero, to kind of have such a big second and third act in his life. When he got back, um, he was a big bona fide hero in 1918, and uh, he um, started out um, creating a car, a new car. He designed a car called the Rickenbacker, and there's still some copies, still some of those around. People love them. It was one of the first cars to have four brakes, and um, he um, that company went bankrupt. And uh, instead of personally um, uh, d- declaring bankruptcy, he said to all his lenders um, that he would, you know, he would be good for his money, and he paid back every single cent. And so, what his name had a real um, kind of um, strong uh, thing to it, so that he could go into a bank and and uh, uh, get loans and bring people. Well, together. he was a strong brand, and he had honor. Absolutely. And that really came through. And so when he ended up in 1927, uh, there were some problems with the Indianapolis 500. He bought it uh, from a friend of his and kept it running through the Depression and into uh, World War II. So he really did. His word was bond. And he saw what was going on in the early airline industry uh, as that was beginning. Civil aviation was just beginning to emerge. And he wanted to be a part of that. So uh, he uh, took a couple gambles on a couple companies. Companies that nobody thought were going to work out, and through his management and leadership, he started cobbling things together. Uh, and pretty much before you knew it, he was um, 
uh, you know, running Eastern Airlines, uh, one of the four big uh, airlines that really put civil aviation on the map uh, in the 40s and the 50s. Mm -hmm. How did he do? You know, he did really great. Um, He really brought it up to be, you know, one of the top uh, uh, civilian air carriers. And this is, of course, in a time when there was really no air, no structure, you know, yet. There weren't airfields all over the place. The routes weren't worked out. The federal government wanted to keep involved with air mail. And so there's a lot of things to sort out. He had a couple tussles with FDR over the role of the government. So there were a lot of things to work out. And in all of this, he was quite an innovator. He came up with the the Eastern Shuttle between New York and uh, uh, Washington, D.C. that was really quite successful. And uh, so it was a... um, quite a uh, he he excelled in those environments when people said you couldn't do something and it just wouldn't happen people didn't want to get on planes because they were crashing all the time um, the routes were were uncertain. Uh, it was expensive, and he really started to change all of that and to bring air travel uh, to to you and I. Mm-hmm. Now, you and I both write nonfiction, so I know there is a lot of research that goes into a book of this nature. And and I also know that a number of stories just don't make the cut. Obviously, uh, every piece of research can't go into a book where they'd be, you know, a million pages long. So was there anything, any fact or story about Rickenbacker that, that didn't make it into the book that fascinated you? Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think. We... Um... The what was interesting uh, about Rickenbacker was that he, uh, and this goes back. This is what I really am promo- promoting in this book. I really began to understand that he was very afraid of that anonymity. We were talking about that of going back. He always felt that he was just one step away from being back in Columbus and trudging into a factory for the rest of his life. Even though he became a great success, and he what he really depended on was making himself a hero, this really incredible hero to everybody. And so he worked with his autobiographers um, and was, uh, and these books came out that uh, there were, you know, a lot of fabrication in it. Um, He kind of encouraged the, you know, the ghost writers to kind of, you know, go, go have some fun with this, tell some really great stories and don't worry about the truth so much. And so this guy, um, I really had to go back through, there's just like this varnished layer about him, you know, this great war hero and this great CEO of Eastern and all like this, this great car racer and this great, to really get into who he was, it was very hard because I had, and I kept going back and back and back. For well, you had to put, peel all these veneers off that made him, you know, that bumped him up to being larger than life to try to get to the real person. Absolutely. So what um, one of my best sources, interestingly enough, it was in he uh, 1965, he's 75 at that point. He decides he's going to have his big autobiography published. So he hires this ghostwriter, Boots Herndon, and they spend a year, uh, two or three times a week talking for a couple hours, and it's all transcribed. And Eddie, you have to remember, never was really much of a writer. He quit seventh grade. Um, He was pretty rough around the edges. But as a CEO, he became a very – he could dictate it to his secretary quite well. Mm -hmm. So I have 7,000 pages that are at the – of this transcription of these conversations, wide-ranging conversations that they would have. And um, it's fabulous to see this and to go I, I i got them scanned and then i put them in notebooks and i had the, i indexed them and i cross indexed them and i have all these notes and he contradicts himself and he's angry and he's funny and he's this and that because nobody when talking about yourself for a year can keep everything consistent so what i began to see you know and we all tell stories about ourselves and our lives um but he was um and what was in these stories were not often really reflected in the final autobiography, which was more just, you know, he was, and, you know, so, so that part about his childhood and his father dying, you know, he, 
in the autobiography, his father did not die in an altercation with an African-American person. He, uh, Rickenbacker, remembered that his father was the foreman on a, on a bridge building job and a, and a crane with some wood had knocked him in the head and killed him in a tragic accident. Well, it wasn't that at all. But uh, did he remember it that way or did he spin it that way? Well, you know, it's very interesting, and that's where it gets, you know, quite fascinating. Um, I think it's a combination of both, but I think towards the end of his life, he had told himself so much that this is what happened, that he believed it. Mm-hmm. And Did he have you know, shame about his poverty, growing up in poverty? Oh, and deep. Yeah. yeah. Deep yeah. shame about that. and uh, Oftentimes when we see people taking heroic measures and great risk, we find that, that they're compensating in a very extraordinary way for something that they have shame for. Absolutely, Rebecca. You know, and I think, you know, without cycle, you know, analyzing him too much, um, mm-hmm. that certainly was a, a root and, uh, of his incredible determination and his incredible uh, drive. And I think that that was a really sustaining, uh, you know, source for him. I think in that, um, and, you know, it's interesting when you set out to write a book about somebody, you don't know at the end whether you're going to like them, what you're going to discover. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, 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 part of the, it, It's an adventure for the writer, too, of course. Otherwise, it wouldn't be very interesting, certainly. Um, and as I was, um, the, the, his childhood, which he would, of course, write about as, oh, is this kind of idyllic childhood? Yeah, we had some hard times and we did, we went hungry sometimes, but yeah, but it was real. It was character shaping. You know, he did learn um, how, after he got knocked down, to get up smiling again and just, uh, and to persevere and to find new unorthodox ways to get around things. When somebody said, well, you're just a poor kid from nowhere, what do you know about anything? And so in those, I found some really interesting, you know, ideas about that sort of thing. Uh, I, I, there's a story about, um, General Eisenhower. Well, now, uh, John, uh, yeah. we're going to have to take our last scheduled break. So hold on to that story about General Eisenhower, because I know that people are on pins and needles to hear it. So we'll we'll hear about that when we come back from these important messages from our sponsors. You're listening to the Costa Report. Now, if you've been listening to the Costa Report, you know that I'm a big fan of wines by Caraccioli Cellars. And today I'm here with Scott Caraccioli, who's one of the brains behind the most memorable wines money can buy. So I have a question for you. How did your family get into the wine business? Um, You know, in 2006, my father, his brother and uncle were really playing with the idea of planting a vineyard and... Planting a vineyard turned into making a bottle, turned into making sparkling wine when um, Michelle came into the picture. So it was really kind of an organic situation, us being in agriculture in the Salinas Valley. And then the extension of that went to grapes, and here we are today. To find out more about Caraccioli Wines, visit us at www.caracciolicellars.com or stop by our tasting room in downtown Carmel, California. That's Caraccioli Cellars, C-A-R-A-C-C-I-O-L-I, Cellars, where one bottle is never enough. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. Who might you save? Your mother, your father, your husband, uncle, aunt, son. 
Learn fast. F-A-S-T. The sudden signs of a stroke and you could save your friend, your best friend, teacher, boss, coach. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. F-A-S-T. Face, arm, speech, time. That's F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. The sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in the recovery of your neighbor, the waiter, a fellow shopper, a total stranger, grandmother, grandfather. So learn FAST, the sudden signs of a stroke, then pass it on because you never know who might save you. Your wife, your colleague, teammate, mother. Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. As I went through school, one giant question loomed over me. What did I want to be? But in order to know what I wanted to be, I had to first decide what I wanted to make. I wanted to make more. So I became a teacher. Now I make learning a privilege, not a chore. And frustration a tool, not an obstacle. I make working hard seem easy and giving up impossible. I make an old subject feel like a fresh thought and unconventional methods common. I make material things less important and little things like patience and kindness count. I make weekdays more exciting than weekends, and classrooms feel like anything but. I make things different, which is all I ever hoped for. I'm a teacher. I make more. Find out how you can make more at teach.org. Make more. Teach. Brought to you by Teach and the Ad Council. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and today our guest is John Ross. And you were just about to tell us a story about General Eisenhower. Well, you know, I was. The, uh, uh, we were getting to really the root cause of, uh, the, of courage. And this is what I became, just this book became all about, that I didn't realize it and uh, at the beginning. And uh, so I... Uh, General Eisenhower um, as a cadet at West Point, and they were about a week separated in age, Eddie Rickenbacker and, and uh, Ike. He got, uh, he was in a, they were doing some boxing, and a very bruised and battered uh, young uh, Eisenhower was getting, uh, uh, someone was getting the best of him, and he got up kind of grumbling and all that, and uh, famously, uh, his uh, trainer said, you know, if if you can't smile when you get up from a knockdown, then you're ne- never going to lick anybody. You're never going to lick an opponent. Mm-hmm. And that was something that Eddie did. Eddie said, you know, he he fought, you know he would fight like a wild cat. He said, for that which I want, and I fight to the last ditch. At such times as I have been licked, it has been my experience that ninety time, ninety nine times out of a hundred, and I've been licked often. It was just the right thing to have happen. So it's a very interesting when you start pushing into this guy who has been licked a lot and how he kept getting up and how he kept doing it again. Um, and a particularly great story, uh, just when you thought that you might never hear of Eddie Rickenbacker, happened on a life raft in the middle of the Pacific uh, in 1943. Well, which is you an know, incredible story. It, it, yeah. This brings up a, a point in other conversations that you and I have had. Uh, we've worried about some of the shortage of role models and heroes that we can look up to in the world today. So so often we have to look back in time to find these larger-than-life figures who have the, let's say, moral integrity and compassion of an Atticus Finch and the, and the courage and perseverance of an Eisenhower, let's say. Um, uh, and after getting to know Rickenbacker the way that you have, um, is it safe to say he's one of your heroes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I you know, that's one of the reasons I really wanted to write this book was because I really wanted to think about this and actually, you know, introduce the, you know, America back to him because he's just at the everybody a generation ago knew him. Um, and we we know him a little bit kind of in just kind of just to know his name. But I wanted to, again, talk about what what it was exactly what you what you were talking about is you know he was just able to you know these guys were 
had the leadership, the ethical makeup, the commitment, and this this deep abiding courage, and I call it enduring courage. It's not the quite odd courage you get if you're standing on a corner and a car races over a curb and pins a child to a, you know, uh, the pavement, and you and you can wrest the car off. It's not that kind of thing. It is a whole way of living your life with um, this sense of uh, really getting up and doing it and, you know, not saying no, and yet being aware of things around you. When he was flying in the air, he would teach his young cadets, it's not just something to go in and forget fear. You have to know, I am scared, he would say to his cadets. I am scared. I have fear. You have to work with that, and you can overcome that, not by ignoring it. That's how you die. Or not being cowered by it. That's how you are too tentative and you die too. But by looking it straight in the face and working with it and taming it. And I think that there are great lessons for us today because I do see so much today of a lot of whining and a lot of problems with, uh, with this kind of courage. And this was the kind of courage, Rebecca, that really built this country. This is what George Washington had and Ulysses Grant and I, Eisenhower, as you mentioned. Um, these were uh, and Amelia Earhart and a wonderful people who really built this country. And I wanted to remind um, readers really what that was about. And and this is a wonderful reminder because the kind of courage you're talking about is the word I use is foundational. It there's just an underpinning in how these individuals moved through their life uh and how they saw opportunity, risk and even failure. Um they they weren't interested in blaming anyone. They were just interested in saying, "Well, I tried that, that didn't work." Um, and it didn't work because of my my own inadequacy, my own inability to see what was coming. And now I learn from that and move forward. And in this particular case, you know, uh, Rickenbacker was not only bullied as a child because of his poverty, but even, uh, and we forget about this, even when he was a an, an ace, uh, he was accused of being a spy because of the of his last name. Oh yeah, absolutely. I famously in 1916 he he took a ship over to Liverpool and uh to check out the new racing engines that were coming out of Britain and they were just really great. He wanted to find that out and he struck up a conversation with these two guys and he thought that they were Canadian businessmen but their their accents were a little weird. So he was about to get off the ship in Liverpool and he this policeman grabs him and throws him into this room and there are these two uh his purported friends and they're cold as uh Bicycles, he said, and they're Scotland Yard guys, and they throw him down, and they rip his shirt off. They are, and I'm not kidding you. They're looking for secret messages written on his chest, mm-hmm. uh, and they peel his, you know, with the heels off his shoes to look for secret messages. He was. Um, so th- they sent those files, the British sent those files over to the Americans, and up until the time he was even an ace, which he had, means in American air service he had shot down five Germans, they still had a guy on the ground near him reporting on every letter he had written, all his conversations. So you can imagine what he is overcoming. You know, here's a guy suspected even at that point of being a spy. I mean, Well, this a, is a, a true story about overcoming challenges, obstacles uh, in your way from the time that you're a child all the way throughout your life and not letting those things get in your way. And uh, it is it is a thrilling book. And I thank you, John, for writing it. Now, for our listeners, where can they go to learn more about you and to buy Enduring Courage? Do you have a website? Yes. Well, it's John F., as in Frank Ross, dot com, and you can learn all about that and some of the other books I've written. And certainly on Amazon, you can read the uh, 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 order it and in bookstores everywhere um, and read some of the reviews. Uh, there have been, been a few. And uh, I encourage people to take a take a take a look. He's quite a hero. And I and I guarantee you it's not boring. <laughs> no, it is not. Well, unfortunately, uh, we are all out of time, but I want to thank you for for writing this amazing account of one of our national heroes. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Thank you, Rebecca, for having me on. I enjoyed it. If your station is leaving us after this hour and you have a question or a comment to make about today's program, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. We're pretty much all over the Internet. And uh, let me know how you felt about our conversation today with John Ross. Again, his book is titled Enduring Courage. And there are very few writers who can bring... uh, 
action on the racetrack and in combat uh, to life the way John Ross can. This is an account well worth reading. I highly recommend this book. And and by the way, if you missed the full interview with John Ross today or any of our other weekly guests, remember that you can download previous episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, and our new YouTube channel. And while you're at our website, take a moment to check out the new video of the first public debate on the Affordable Health Care uh, Act and, and how it's affecting public and private insurers uh, six months after the fact. The debate is hosted by Fox News personality Juan Williams, and I'm one of the members of this controversial and very entertaining panel. If you haven't seen the video yet, just go to RebeccaCosta.com, and it's right there on the homepage. And if you want to know what's happening to health insurance from the commercial side, this is the video to watch. I think you'll be surprised. I also remind those of you who have not picked up your copy of The Watchman's Rattle, to click on the image of the book on our website and order your copy right now. This is the only book which shows how complexity, overregulation, and more data than at any other time in human history is producing gridlock and a mass confusion between empirical facts and opinions. Not only are our leaders confused, you and I are also having a heck of a time making rational decisions because we can't separate fact from cleverly disguised fiction. So get your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. Do it right now. All proceeds from the book go toward keeping quality programming like the interview just heard with John Ross on the air. And if you listen on a regular basis, I don't need to tell you how much divisive programming has filled the airwaves. So let's do our part and cast our vote for quality, nonpartisan journalism. Uh, And the way you vote today is with your dollars, and I know you know that. One book purchase at a time is how we vote. We have a special guest in store for you next week who was not able to confirm before we went live on the air today. So please take a moment to check your local affiliate schedule online uh, to find out who will be going one-on-one with me next week right here in the studio. And uh, join us again on the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for another hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report.